Sup, how y'all living, my friends? So, in my last video series, we went balls deep into the role DHT, dihydrotestosterone, plays in the human organism and why in adulthood, DHT is a trash hormone that can be safely suppressed in adult human beings. The most commonly prescribed drug to suppress this trash hormone DHT, whether it be for an enlarged prostate or for hair loss, is finasteride. And the reason why it is commonly prescribed by medical professionals is because it is clinically proven to be extremely safe safe and effective with a high rate of clinically proven success even after 10 years of usage. And finasteride is also proven to be safe with only a very low incidence of side effects that will usually go away on their own with continued use or through titration adjustments and will always go away upon cessation. Of course, the mechanism behind how finasteride suppresses dihydrotestosterone is very well understood at this point. We know it works through the suppression of the type 2 5A reductase enzyme, which is most active on the scalp and the prostate, and the 5A reductase enzyme is the chemical produced which converts the good hormone testosterone into the worthless trash hormone dihydrotestosterone, DHT. So even though it is well known that DHT after physical maturation of men is worthless and can be safely suppressed, we also know that the 5A reductase enzyme plays other important physiological roles in the human organism, and as such, people who take finasteride may feel a bit hesitant, not because of suppressing DHT necessarily, but specifically because they're worried about the collateral damage suppressing the 5A reductase enzyme may have on other parts of the body, in particular the role the 5A enzyme plays in the development of certain neurosteroids. So, there are a lot of studies on the subject, but many, if not most of them, are performed on animals, in particular rats, who always get the short end of the stick, it seems, when it comes to medical research. But let's see what kind of data these studies yield and find out whether or not these rats died in vain. So, a recent study from a collaboration of several universities released a study on the role of 5AR inhibition in rats. The first thing they did was do a breakdown of the role of the 5A reductase enzyme in human physiology, where they cover its roles beyond just the conversion version of testosterone into DHT. Besides the effect on testosterone, the 5-AR enzyme also converts progesterone into the 5-alpha dehydroprogesterone, also called DHP, and it converts deoxycorticosterone into 5-alpha dehydrodeoxycorticosterone, also known as DHDOC. So by just hearing the names of these chemicals, you can see the relation they have with dehydrotestosterone, the full name of which is 5-alpha dehydrotestosterone. So the 5-AR our enzymes role in the body is basically just to take existing hormones in the body and convert them to similar hormones by affecting the chemical bonds to alter them for another purpose. So anyways, the DHP that gets created via the 5-AR enzyme is the precursor to the ever-so-important tetrahydroprogesterone, which is also known by the more familiar name allopregnanolone, or AP, which is the most asked-about neurosteroid, but there are also several other neurosteroids that are created from byproducts of the 5-AR enzyme, although not directly, and these have names like 5-alpha-androstan-3-alpha, 17-beta-diol, also known as 3-alpha-diol, and and tetrahydroxydeoxycorticosterone, which, thank God, can be abbreviated as THAOC, I mean THDOC. So, even though there are many different types of neurosteroids, they all serve a similar function. Namely, they affect what are called the GABA receptors, which is an acronym for gamma amino butyric acid, which are in the brain and have to do with the reaction to stress in the brain and also relate to depression. Studies have shown that there is a decrease in GABA activity in people with anxiety and depression. Modulators of the GABA receptors are effective anti-anxiety agents and they also prevent depression. So allopregnanolone and the other neurosteroids are essentially natural antidepressants, so, sort of. So a drug like finasteride, which might lower the production of allopregnanolone, might trigger depression in some people. So this may be why some people report depression or brain fog while taking finasteride. And depression is even listed as a potential, albeit rare, side effect of finasteride. So anyways, getting back to the study, they also note that finasteride has also proven to be used for certain psychiatric problems. For example, 
Finasteride has been shown to be an effective treatment for Tourette's syndrome, which as many of you guys know, is a condition where people get mental tics, which can be anything from repetitive movements or even cursing and shouting nonsensical things at random, you know, kind of like the Propecia Help Forums. It has also been shown to help treat pathological gambling, as well as even treating alcoholism. So Finasteride, for all the criticism it gets for potentially causing depression, also can cause a lot of good in people with life debilitating psychiatric disorders, probably again due to its effect on neurosteroids and not because of the effect on DHT, which as we all know by now is a trash hormone. So again, in the study, they use rats, and to eliminate the effect of finasteride on DHT in the study, they just uh, wanted to look at neurosteroids. So what they did is that they performed an orchiectomy on the rodents, which means they cut their balls off, thus eliminating most of their testosterone, which means there was very little testosterone to convert into DHT. They then did behavioral studies on the rats, looking at things like how much they moved, how quickly they would escape from a confined space, and how much they ate, how much social interaction they had, and how they did crossing a wire bridge, which is kind of like a rodent tightrope. They also looked at drinking behaviors, like whether or not they'd go for saccharine water versus just plain water. So basically the tests were looking at how the rats responded to stressful situations and how active they were. They also measured adrenocorticotropin levels, aka ACTH in the blood, and corticotropin releasing hormone, aka CRH, in the hypothalamus, which are both increased during stress. The rats were divided into groups. One group just got an injection of saline, and the others got finasteride injected directly into their bellies. The dosages of the finasteride groups were split between three different dosages, ranging from 10, 25, to 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, although they were just given the dosage once and retested 45 minutes later. Keep in mind, an average human being weighs 70 kilograms, so if this study were to be replicated in humans using similar dosages, they'd have to give doses ranging from 700 to 3,500 milligrams of finasteride at a time. Keep in mind, the standard dose of finasteride for treating male pattern baldness is just one milligram daily, and even smaller doses than that have proven to be effective. So this would be like if a human were to take 700 to 3,500 Propecias, since that is the brand of finasteride that comes in one milligram. Now, we know finasteride has its dosing peak when it comes to DHT suppression, as 0.2 milligrams of finasteride suppresses only about 15 to 20 percent less DHT than 5 milligrams, but that doesn't account for other 5-AR activity, namely the neurosteroid effects that we're talking about here in this video. So what were the results of this study? First of all, finasteride, even with the highest dose, which I'll remind you is the human equivalent of 3,500 milligrams of finasteride, did not affect the mobility of the rats, but the rats did have less drive to explore their surroundings and also less sociability, indicating possible symptoms of rat depression. Finasteride also decreased rats' impulsivity and made them take fewer risks. The rats, for instance, were less likely to cross the suspension bridge in the test, which I guess isn't necessarily a bad thing, as you know, taking fewer risks may increase their chances of survival. The rats also also had less preference for drinking the saccharin beverage, but this was only on the highest dose of, on, of finasteride, keep in mind. And even the smallest dose they had the rats on is still unfathomably higher than what any human would take for hair loss. But they also found that finasteride decreased the ACTH and CRH levels, which are the hormones that respond to stress. So one way to interpret all this is that the rats were less anxious, which could correspond with the research done on finasteride treating Tourette's syndrome. So it wasn't all bad here. They also found that the results weren't any different when they tested finasteride on the orchiectomized castrated rats, implying that the DHT didn't play any role in these results, and that these results, results were all due to its effect on neurosteroids, further demonstrating the fact that DHT is a trash hormone. So, to summarize these results, it seems that in rats at least, a very high dose of finasteride affects rats' behavior in ways that are both good and bad. The rats were more chill and less anxious, but also a little lazier and a little less sociable. But before we can apply any of these results to humans, remember that this is a study on the acute effects of a very, very high dose of finasteride. So it is hard to translate this into chronic low doses of finasteride that humans take for things like hair loss or enlarged prostate. The the second a very important point that is that unlike in humans, finasteride in rats affects both the type 1 and type 2 5-AR isoenzyme. Finasteride in humans only affects the type 2 5-AR isoenzyme, and it only has a negligible effect on the type 1. And the type 1, unlike the type 2 isoenzyme, is not active on the scalp or prostate, so it doesn't relate to hair loss at all. 
However, the type 1 as well as the type 2 is active in the brain, so any neurological effects finasteride has on rodents would be amplified by the fact that finasteride is affecting the type 1 and the type 2 isoenzyme in the brain, as opposed to humans taking it since in the case of humans, it only affects the type 2, which is probably why such side effects are so rare to begin with. This is possibly also the reason why many doctors feel more comfortable recommending finasteride over dutasteride, because even though dutasteride suppresses more DHT overall, it also, unlike finasteride, suppresses the type 1 5 AR and isoenzyme, thus theoretically contributing to more sides. That may be why many people say they responded well to finasteride, for instance, but got really bad side effects when they switched to dutasteride. So even though dutasteride is often used by people over finasteride, they often do it due to the misconception that finasteride isn't working for them or working well enough. And this is because people will often self-medicate or their doctor will not properly inform them about what to expect from the drug. And then they'll misinterpret a shedding phase as a sign that the drug isn't working for them, or they'll misinterpret the lack of regrowth as a sign that the drug isn't working, when in reality, maintenance is what these drugs do best, and not everybody will necessarily regrow anything, but rather just maintain the hair they still have. So, a lot of people who think they need dutasteride actually don't. Finasteride is good enough for the overwhelming majority of hair loss sufferers, and the lack of type 1 inhibition from finasteride could mean less risk of neurological side effects, especially since dutasteride has a much longer half-life than finasteride, five weeks in fact, whereas finasteride's half-life is only six to eight hours. But since finasteride outright kills the DHT on your scalp, it can keep scalp DHT suppressed for at least longer than a day, which is why people can successfully use it every other day as scalp DHT will still be low even after the drug leaves their system. So that's one of the many reasons I prefer finasteride over dutasteride, although both will definitely get the job done when it comes to treating hair loss. So Rat and rodent studies like the one I went over may help explain why some people get neurological side effects like depression or brain fog using finasteride, but keep in mind, we're talking about animals that react differently to finasteride than humans do due to the increased role finasteride plays in the suppression of the type 1 5AR enzyme compared to humans, and also all these rat studies are extre using extremely high doses of finasteride that would never under any circumstances be used by a human being. These kind of studies do not explain how a side effect like depression, for instance, would persist after stopping the drug because the neurosteroid levels we know do return to normal once the 5-AR blockade is eliminated by stopping the drug, or in many cases just by lowering the dosage, which is why many doctors will start their patients off with 0.5 milligrams every other day, or even less than that, and it still works while potentially mitigating side effects. So the claims you hear from the PFS Foundation Insane Asylum about persistent side effects are not substantiated by any scientific research, and I go more in depth about that in my post-finasteride syndrome videos, uh, which I recently created, and I'll go ahead and link those below for those who want to know more about why post-finasteride syndrome is a fake condition made up by mentally ill hypochondriacs. So if you're interested, I recommend watching them. I'll link them below. But one final point I'll add to all this is remember, depression is one of the most common illnesses in the world and has many causes that can be from internal or external factors. I mean, even hair loss can cause depression. I mean, believe me, I know. So treating hair loss by itself can be seen as a means of treating depression. Also, depression occurring while on finasteride or after taking finasteride can be due to many other factors besides finasteride. So just because somebody may be depressed or experience some negative condition while on finasteride does not mean finasteride is what caused it. It kind of reminds me of when people criticize me for being a vegan. Like, for instance, I may get a cold one week and then people will jump to the conclusion that it must have been the veganism that caused it. Remember that correlation does not equal causation, and just like how people cannot prove my veganism gave me a cold one week, the anti-finasteride fanatics cannot prove that finasteride caused any of their negative symptoms. It's just a convenient way for them to have something they can blame it on, and a potentially lucrative thing too, since most of them are hoping their fake condition can be used for lawsuits against Merck to make them rich, since let's face it, not every judge and jury is going to be scientifically literate enough to realize that these people's 
problems are due to other issues. Most likely, it's just that they have a nocebo effect because they lack critical thinking skills and they just trust random anecdotes on the internet rather than trusting in scientific research. It's either that or they're just lying. So the reason why I bring that up is because people often mention the fact that Merck has faced lawsuits over Propecia in the past, but the fact is that medical malpractice lawsuits happen all the goddamn time, and most of them are completely frivolous. There have even been tort reform uh, legislations proposed by the U.S. government to cut down on the outrageous number of frivolous bullshit lawsuits that do nothing but just waste the court's time, and they also prevent pharmaceutical companies from being able to invest more into important research since they have to waste money and time defending themselves from bullshit lawsuits. So that's something to keep in mind the next time somebody tries to make a point based on the existence of a lawsuit rather than using science. So anyways, nobody is suggesting that finasteride can't potentially cause side effects in a small percentage of human beings. And it is very well possible that the mechanism behind the said side effects could be related to the suppression of the 5-AR enzyme. But remember, the chances you or anyone else who chooses to start taking finasteride will get these side effects is extremely low. And even if you do get side effects, chances are the side effects will go away on their own has as has been demonstrated by scientific research, and failing that, you can simply just try a lower or less frequent dose as instructed by your doctor. Regarding the incidence of depression in people taking 5-AR inhibitors, I'll go ahead and quote from a 2016 study that reviewed all the data, and I'll go ahead and link it below, but anyways, the authors concluded, quote, currently, there is no direct link between 5-AR inhibitor use and depression. However, several small studies have led depression to be listed as a side effect on the medication package. Unquote. So the incidence of depression for finasteride is so low that we didn't even know it existed until the post-marketing studies, and even then, it has never been shown to be prevalent, even at the standard dosage, which again, may not even be necessary for the majority of people, as many people respond well at dosages that are reduced to 0.5 or 0.25 milligrams daily or even every other day. If someone observes all this data and still concludes that they're so scared to start finasteride and would rather go bald than risk even a minuscule chance of some small psychological side effects that can easily be mitigated through dosing adjustments, then at that point, maybe they should just go ahead and just shave it, bro, and leave the rest of us alone and stop it with the fear mongering. I mean, just because you are too chicken shit to save your hair doesn't mean you need to cope by trying to scare everybody else into being bald, sexless, and miserable just like you are. I mean, if the choice is saving my hair with the small chance of depression or brain fog versus going bald, then I'll just go ahead and take those odds, as there is nothing finasteride could even theoretically do to me that can come anywhere close to being as bad as being a slaphead. So if you disagree with this, Bald Cafe's channel is right over that way. But if you like those odds, then maybe you'll find something useful on my channel. Anyways, thank you and God bless.